In him, you read it, does not sin. Sin it not. Whoever abides in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. <coughs> he that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So who's righteous? The one who does righteous. Don't let somebody fool you and try to say, that you can live in sin and you can continue to live in the state that you used to be and still be okay. Now, does it mean that you're never going to make a mistake? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means this, that you have been changed and your attitude has changed and you are no longer a habitual sinner. Meaning, you don't sin and sin and sin and make excuses for your sin and your sin your, your sin should be if, if, because he says, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Meaning, it should be not, not, not the, 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 the thing that happens often, but it should be the thing that, my goodness, I didn't realize what I did. I'm sorry. Or if you did sin, you have an advocate with the Father. But it's for those who walk in the Spirit, who live in Christ, they, they, they don't sin because he says in verse 7, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin, come on, read it. Read it. Track with me right here. Is of the devil. He that commits sin is of the devil. Now, now who's of the devil? I mean, who, who, who does sin? Who's a liar? The father of the devil. And so, so which nature are we? See, see we have Christ who is without sin, we have Satan, who is nothing but sin. And which one is ruling in my mortal body? Which one am I letting rule in me? It's a, it's a, it's a tough decision when we get down to the nitty gritty. We think so. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, why did Jesus come? To destroy the works of the devil. Why did he come? To destroy the works of the devil in your life, in my life. And, and can I tell you this? This is what sanctification is. It's a process. Did you get it overnight? Did you, did, did you, did you all of a sudden uh, just walk in complete purity and all of it over? No. It's a lifetime experience, a purification process to where as I learn and ask the Holy Spirit, He helps me to live a, 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 a more holy life. I, I can tell you this. Tonight... I can, I, I've been able, and, and, and I would say there's, there's been things that I've gone through this past year that, that when I started year number one in my, in my Christian walk, I would have never been able to withstand. But being here, now some 23, 24 years later, knowing Jesus Christ and, and having walked with Him and having been strengthened by Him, there's some things that would have probably still bothered me in my, my year one that, that don't even, they don't even face me. People, people can say what they want about you. And, and when you were in year one, they, they, man, you're ready to... You, that, that old man is still kind of fresh. Whereas in, in walking with Christ, now it's... They're not saying it about me, Jesus. They're saying it about you. And... And, and God, they're not, they're not coming against me. They're coming against, they're coming against you and your church. You see, it's so much easier when you can lay your burdens at His feet and say this, they're not my burdens anymore, God. They're yours. They're your burdens. They're, they're your burdens. And so, so, so 
it's it's a process. Can I tell you this is this is where it becomes liberating. It becomes free. You you and I can overcome and live above this. So he continues, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God does, <coughs> does not commit sin. And, and here he's saying, he, he doesn't commit sin. Why? For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, I'll... I'll, 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 I'll Kind of peel the layers back on that in just a second. Let me just read this last verse. This In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Meaning, the dividing line is very, very clear. Whoever does not, does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. Now, what he's saying right here in, in verse 9, I'm gonna because I, I want to get into the meat of this. He says, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Meaning, Jesus Christ, born of God, his seed is in you. That seed of Jesus Christ, when you when you became a believer, the Bible says that God came to live in you. Now, if he came to live in you, there's no sin in him. And so therefore, we've got to work it out of ourselves. This is the hope that we're purifying ourselves. We know that Jesus Christ lives here. We know that we are the temple of God. And therefore, we've got to allow Christ to come in and, and help us and, and, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there is a part that we have to do. I, I've been thinking about this and I, I'm not going to, to unfold it all before you today. But this has been rolling through my mind. Something that's been rolling through my mind. And, and, and I'm just kind of working on it, trying to develop it. But here's the thing. If, if, if someone came to you and said to you, um, um, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm, I'm relieve you of all of your debt. I'm going to... You didn't know this person. They just came to you and said to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay your house off. Take care of, I'm going to take care of all of your bills. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay your, your, all, the, all of your credit cards, your, your payments. Student, don't worry about it. It's gone. Because of that act of generosity, of mercy, and of grace, you would be so grateful towards that person, at least you should be, that, that there would be a relationship that would begin. Right? Now, now here's the thing. Now, now, now say, say, say that person, same person came over to your house and, and you walked around the house and said, yeah, you know, man, thank you for this. Thank you for what you've done. And, and you see some big old tree limbs sitting over your house and you say, and you tell a man, if I don't get rid of that, that's going to, one day it's going to crush this house, man. And, and you just look at him. Are you expecting him to get rid of it? Many times that's what we do. Instead of doing it ourselves, we're waiting for Jesus to take care of it. And, and, and then it's like one day, if it does fall and it does crush the house, whose fault is that? And this is the thing. We see sin in our lives and we see it there looming and hanging over us. And we just say to, to God, man, if that thing crushes and falls one day, man, it's going gonna, it's gonna to crush the, that house. It's going to crush me. And, and, and God is saying, I've given you the weapons. I've given you everything that you need. Take care of the sin. You see, we just want him to somehow just come in. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm going to bring a. I'm, I'm going to bring my own equipment in, and I'm just going to, you know, magically remove it or whatever. No, God wants us and expects us now to be stewards of what He purchased. See, there's a responsibility upon on our part, upon us. To, to take and to keep what God has given us. And, and it would be like this. 
Say, say that he did all of that, and then you go out, and, and, and you see him maybe, maybe, maybe a year later, and you say, you know what, you got everything, you did all of that, but, but all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I, I figured I'd buy myself a new house. And I got myself into some more debt, and I, and I did all of this, and I did all of that. Do you expect him to do it again? You see, this, if we begin to look at sin in this manner, if we are going to be irresponsible with what he has given us, then is, do we think that he's somehow obligated to doing what he did again? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, that he died once, he dies no more. There's no more remission of sins. Now, you can interpret that however you'd like to interpret that. But, but, but in other words, if you're going to play around with the grace, the mercy, and the blood of Jesus Christ, then that's on you. That's not on him. But a person that is truly grateful, a person that is truly feels indebted to another person, purifies themselves. When you realize one day what Jesus saved you from, you're going to wish that you purified yourself. You're going to wish that you took those actions. You know the only one that can hold that tongue back? You. With the power of the Holy Spirit that He's given you. Who's the only one that can stop you? Who's the only one that can, you know, any one of us could do whatever we wanted tonight. God has given you a free will and a free choice. But all of a sudden we get this super spiritual rather than delving into the word of God and seeing for, it, for what it means. We, we get this super spiritual. Oh no, if God doesn't want me to do it, doesn't want me to have it, he's going to take it away from me. No. He gives you those responsibilities because here's the thing. Do you want to be a part of this? Or don't you want to be a part of this? You choose. It's like the parable that Jesus was telling when the man was having a party. He invited the guest and one said, well, I've got some, some errands to take care of. I've got a wife to marry. I've, another one said this, another one said that. And all of them were making excuses. And, and basically what he said was cancel their reservations and find somebody that wants to be here. And I tell you this, believers who make excuses are no believers at all. They may, they may sometimes, just like that one man that comes into the party and he says, wait, who's this guy that's here? They may once in a while straggle in and wander in, but they're no, they're, they're no guests to the party. You see, you see, it has to become our life. Everything that God has given us has been for the benefit of His church. Has been for the benefit of His church. He made a deposit in you and me. And the church, and only the church that is in right standing, has the right to draw from that deposit. To meet all of her needs. You see, God gave Jesus. He gave the name. It has within it the fullness of the Godhead. Think about this. It has the wealth of the of eternity. I mean, God's wealth. He's not getting richer by the moment. He is all powerful. The storehouses are already full. The Bible says even in the last days, he has storehouses of snow and of hail and of different things. They're already there. The wealth of the eternities, the love of the Father, all of this is given to us in the name of Jesus Christ. And yet we do not realize what we have as the church. And, and many times we live in such a manner as, as we think that we are, we, you know, we, we're blind. We think that we're rich. We think that we have something. But we are no better than the church of Laodicea who thinks that she's rich, who thinks that she has wealth, who thinks that she has need of nothing. 
And yet Christ comes, knocks on the door and says, come out of there. He says, because you are broken. You are, you, you, you are poor. You are wretched. You are undone. Can I tell you, most of the church is undone and wretched and poor because she does not know Jesus Christ, her Lord and Savior. Mere visitors, mere consumers, if you don't give them what they want, they're gone. Can I tell you this? That's why they don't serve God, because God said He would meet all of our needs. He didn't promise us our wants. Now, don't get me wrong. God is a great God, and He's a good God. And I can tell you this. I've got more than I deserve. But He doesn't have to give me what I want. But He promises to give me what I need. You see, we walk in the Spirit. And we use the name of Jesus Christ. You and I can call upon the name of the Lord. And, and every, every promise that His Word has, the Bible says, is yes and amen unto them that believe. Now hear this. If we're walking in the Spirit and we use that name, then remember this, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's what the Word of God says. And every tongue that rises against us shall be condemned. Now, now think about this. Uh, Elvita brought it up to my mind, uh, to, uh, up, to, uh, up to me this uh, past week or last week. She, she had seen something online and she said, oh, I thought it was so neat. Somebody had, had made a post or something and, and she said, uh, it said that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It didn't say that the weapon wouldn't be formed. It just said that it wouldn't prosper. No, no. I don't know about you. Doesn't mean that it's not. Doesn't mean that the armies aren't going to stand against you. Doesn't mean that Satan isn't going to camp outside your door. Doesn't mean that he's not going to try to come against you and take your life and and put sickness on you and take your children and 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 try to bankrupt you and and try to do all of these things and and bring these things against you. But the Bible says that he shall not prosper in his approach and, and whatever he's trying to do he will not prosper in doing it if you are a child of God then you have nothing to worry about absolutely nothing in this life we have nothing to be concerned of because nothing can happen to us that God that, that God does not permit unless as long as we're in the will of God Nothing can happen to us. Nothing can, I mean, you, if God told you to go somewhere, then go. Do it. If He tells you and calls you to go into another country, then go. Because you know what? In His will, that's where the provision is going to be. You could be living right in the middle of, of, of all the wealth of the world, but God said, says to you or me, hey, I, I need you out in the jungle somewhere, and that's where I'm going to provide for you. Can I tell you this? You need to go out to the jungle, and you need to sit there and wait, because God's going to provide for you there. You could, you could die and go broke thinking that you're, that you're in, in, you know, well, just looks like a good place to be. You see, as long as we're in the will of God, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Now, here's the powerful thing. See, all of this is confined in, in, in that name. It's, it's, it's in that name. It's in that seed of Jesus Christ that is in us. See, we have the right to use the name, the Bible says, against our enemies. When Satan comes against us, we use the name. You see, it's so powerful. Even Michael the Archangel in the book of Jude, when he's wrestling against Satan and contending against Satan, the Bible says, over the body of Moses, the Bible says that he didn't, he didn't sit there and fight with the devil. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. And Satan had to let go. He had to leave. The problem is, is the, only, the, the only people that have a right to use the name are the children of God. Amen. Are those of us who walk in, in righteousness, who live in righteousness, who have committed ourselves to God. Because I can tell you this, that name works every time. How many devils throughout the Word of God did Jesus command to come out that didn't come out? Every one of them came out that Jesus commanded to come out. 
That, work, work, that name works every single time. Now, we have to say that we have the right to use the name in our petitions. When we're calling to God, upon God and petitioning for something that we have need of, we have the right to invoke the name. No other name. No other name is going to get you anything out of heaven except the name of Jesus Christ. But you have to be in a position to where you can use that name. Well, that's that's old teaching. That's that's Old Testament. That's, you know, law teaching. No, that's not law teaching. That's what he's saying right here in first John. Yes. We are the sons of God. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and if we're doing the things that he has commanded us to do, and if we're grateful and living a life that is pleasing to him, then we have the right to use the name. If we are not, then we don't. The opposite is always, always true. See, when we, when we come to the altar, we must recognize this truth. That we have no right to be there apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. We have no right to be there apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. As he said, it's the blood that has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. It is the blood that has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. We are there. On the other hand, because of that blood, because of our union with Christ, we are there by invitation. And God said, come boldly to the throne of grace. He invites us, come. You've got to come to the throne of grace. You see, sometimes we don't want to go to God because, because we don't, we don't, we're not walking where we should, right? And so, so, so the Bible says this, and, and, and I want you to hear this. The Bible says, whatever we, whatever is not of faith is what? Sin. I, 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 this is something that you and I need to apply to our lives. This is why it is so vitally important to live by our convictions. If God has put a conviction upon your heart and it is according to His Word, then you better live by it. And this is what the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling. If you get ready to do something, and the Spirit of God convicts you over it and says, don't do it. And don't do it. You know why? Because you're not doing it in faith. And because you're not doing it in faith, it's, it's sin. And, and, and there can be things that, that, that may not necessarily be a sin, but if you are not doing it in faith, then it, it's sin. Because whatever is not of faith is sin. And, and, and so, so think about this. When you have a, a question in your mind, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Then, then, then don't do it. Pray about it. And you better, get, you better get the victory over it before you do it. Because then you've acted in sin. See, and God says, come. Come boldly. Come boldly to, to the throne of grace. The Bible says that if our heart doesn't condemn us, then, then, then we're all right. If our heart is not condemning us in that moment, then, 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 you know, then, we have, then we can go before God. But if our heart is condemning us over something, we need to get in the altar and wonder and, and, and ask God, what is, it, what is my heart being condemned over? Why am I being, feeling conviction over this? And then when God answers you and you get the victory over that, then you can, then you can come before the throne of God. I'm, I'm telling you, the reason that you have not, James says, is because you ask not. And he says, and then when you ask, you ask amiss. Meaning you ask things that are out of the will of God or, listen to this, you ask out of, outside of faith. And, and God, the only thing that pleases God is faith. The only, the only thing that God responds to is faith. And he says, Come. Come with boldness. How many times? I mean, and, and, and I'm sure that you, there's times where, where you have been walking and you've been living in, in, in you know, your faith out and, and everything, you, you, you just feel like everything is right on 
And in those moments, man, how many of you just feel like, man, I can walk into the throne room of God and, and with boldness, you feel the confidence when you go in there. But, but, but you, you go out there and you do your own thing. You do things against your own convictions. Uh, you get caught up in, in one of these little things. I, I mean, uh, how many of you know and, and, and you would hope this happens more to teenagers and, and younger people than adults. But, but do you remember being a teenager? And, and you got involved in a, in a conversation where, where somebody said, oh, you know this, and, and you wanted to try to outdo them. Or you wanted to try to say, oh, yeah, well, well, well I, and you knew that it wasn't right. And, and it may have been some of a truth, but you, you injected a little bit of a lie into it to make it sound better than it really was. And, and then all of a sudden, conviction comes upon you. And you start feeling, oh, man, what did I do? And then you feel like, man, how do I make this right? How do I undo this? You see, we have to, we have to go back and we have to make those things right. Because then we have confidence with God. Then, then we have, if we're living in faith and we know that our lives are, that we're living our lives in a pleasing manner to God, obeying His commandments and doing what He asked us to do, then we can come into the throne of grace. And when we have an issue, a problem, a sickness, something in our lives, we can come to the throne of God and say, God, in the name of Jesus. we'll have whatever we ask. You see, this isn't a teaching that is happening. I, I actually was listen, listening, uh, I think it was to Chuck Swindoll the other night, driving down the road, and he was talking about how most churches, he said, it, it, and he said, and I don't say this it, it, to condemn any other church. He says, but, but he says, there, there's been people that were at my church and he said, and they, they've come back after six months moving away because they'd had to move. And they said, they, they said, you know, the church that I'm going to, man, I don't even need to take my Bible. They never even opened the Bible. They give some 10, 15 minute little, little, you know, sermonette, uplifting message. And then everybody's on their way and, and, and there's no biblical teaching being taught. And he, and, and he went on to say something to, to, to the effect that, that that's what's wrong with the church today. It has gotten itself into all of these other things, but it has forsaken the Word of God. Can, can I tell you, I don't, I don't want to merely be in some kind of an emotional state and get into all of these feelings and this and that and, and, and walk away from the Word of God. You, there has to be a balance it has to be everything based upon the Word of God. But somewhere along the line, there has to be an experience of what this Word speaks. We have to live and then see the same results that the Word of God promises. Now, if we get into the Word of God and we're never seeing results, then something's wrong. Because there has to be an experience. I didn't get into this thing just to be right. I got into this thing because God said He was going to save me. <coughs> and He saved me. And He said in His Word that these signs shall follow them that believe. And so, so I believe that when He said that these signs shall follow them that believe, then, then those things are for me today. When He said no weapon formed against me shall prosper, then I know that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And I can take His Word. Because what good would knowing His Word without experiencing His Word be? What good would it be if every enemy that stood against me prospered? What good would it be if none of the promises that he made in here were, were for me today? And especially the promise of the Holy Spirit that would come and be my comforter and that he would come and empower me to be a witness. And would, and would give me the strength and the ability to live a life that is holy as I surrender to him. The problem is, is we're not surrendering to Him, and so therefore, we're still living in sin. But 
when we surrender to Him and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, He raises us up. He says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Come. Now, now, now see, some people, they just, in their mind, they get so comfortable with God. They get so comfortable with God. To, to where God is just, a, just another person that, that you just, hey, you know, hey, go, what's up? They think that Jesus is your homeboy and Jesus is this. And no, 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 no. I'm telling you, if he showed up right here, right now, every one of us would be on our faces. Standing in the holiness of God. When he says, come into the throne, come boldly. And I tell you what I picture. I picture the king of kings sitting on his throne and walking up. And you don't go shaking doing that. You come in and you you surrender and you, you hard to even look look him in the eye. Such righteousness, such holiness. You walk in there with utter utter fear. He says something. I'm up, but he's saying, "Come in here boldly. Come in here." What an honor it is that when we get on our knees, we call upon that name Jesus. It's as if the the portal of heaven is open and God's and we're sitting in the throne room of God and God is saying, come, ask what you will. You see, that's the God I serve. The God that is able to do above and beyond what I could ask or think. That's what his word says. That's what I expect. Why do I serve him? Because I know him and I know that he will and that he is able to do what he's promised. He's able to perform what he has promised. I'm not going in there hitting and missing. I'm going in there with boldness and saying, God, this and this is what I'm facing today. I'm having this struggle and I'm having this struggle. And, and I just need some strength. I'm surrendering it to you. I'm fighting against it. It's, it's taking everything that I've got and I'm, and I'm coming before you. I just need you to help me. And the Holy Spirit comes and helps us. What an awesome God. It's not for me to come in there and say, well, you know, I'm really struggling. Your blood wasn't enough. Your son wasn't enough. Your Holy Spirit wasn't enough to, to take care of this. So I'm just going to leave the same way that I came. Weak, beat up, defeated, desperate, destitute. That's not the way I expect to leave when I come out of the presence of God. I expect to come out with power. I expect to come out with authority. I, I expect to come out free. I expect to come out healed. I expect to come out of His presence with that which I've asked Him for because I've asked it in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what the Word of God promises. And if all we have is the Word, and the Word, and the Word, and we don't allow that Word to become a living Word, and if we don't walk in that Word, and we are not obedient to the Word, and we don't live in that Word, in Him we live, we breathe, and we have our being. In Him we're purified. It is through the washing of the water of the Word. Who is the Word? Jesus. It's in Jesus that we are washed and we are cleansed. And as we fill ourselves with this Word, as we fill ourselves with this Word, we become powerful. We become overcomers in the name of Jesus Christ. The problem is, is instead of filling ourselves with the Word, we're filling ourselves with all kinds of other junk. And how can we expect to be powerful? How can we expect to have a clean mind if all we're feeding it is filth? How can we expect that they that have this hope purify themselves? You want to have that same hope? Then get in the Word and let the Holy Spirit do a powerful work in you. Let Him begin to do a transforming, a transformation in you that is changing you from the inside out, that is causing you to rise above, to be the head and not the tail. <coughs> to rise above and not beneath. My goodness, I'm telling you, the Bible says that He's put my feet in a wide place. If you knew who I was, <coughs> I'm telling you, you would understand that it's a miracle that I stand here before you tonight. He's put my feet in a wide place. I didn't put myself here. He put me here. I've obeyed. I've come and 
and that's why I'm here. Because of him. Not because of me. If it was left to me, I'd still be out in that world. Maybe dead. Maybe in a prison cell somewhere. I, who knows what would have been of me. But he's established my footsteps. He's, he's caused me to walk in the high places. It's only because of him. He commands me, come. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Come. See, when I come to the altar... I come there by the blood. I come there in the name of Jesus. I know that my petition, whatever it is that I'm asking, will be answered if I'm standing properly there in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is why it's so important for you and I to live a holy life. The Bible says that without holiness, no man, no man shall see God. This is why it is important. This isn't, this isn't legalism. This is relationship. Somebody saved you. Somebody delivered you. Wouldn't you feel indebted to them? Wouldn't you be thanking them? Imagine if you were sitting on an operating table somewhere and the person sitting next to you, you didn't know them, who they were, and you needed a kidney of theirs. Wouldn't you feel some kind of indebtedness to that person? Well, here Jesus Christ died for you on a cross and you'll one day understand what He saved you from, an eternal hell. And then you'll realize, my goodness, what I couldn't give up because of me for Him. And then you'll realize, then you'll realize, I could have lived a holy life. The problem is, is how many people, how many people get to the end of their life and they say, if I would have only known. If I would have only known that hell was real. I mean, for, for re in reality, I mean, for, for, for real, real. If I would have only known what an eternal hell really was like. And if I would have only known what an eternal heaven meant. If only... If only. If only. See, and it is real. It is real. And Jesus said that He would save you and me from that because He loved us and He loves us. Why do we hold back what belongs to Him? He bought you body, soul, and spirit. Why would we withhold from Him when the Bible says that He didn't withhold from us His Son, His one and only Son? And if He gave His Son, the Bible says, what will He withhold from you and me? And yet some, somehow in our twisted mind, we think that we still got something here to hold on to. And, we, and, we, and, and somehow we, we, we think we're in some kind of a, and, and you may never have thought of it this way, but almost in some kind of a, a poker game, card game with God. And, and let me see if my hand is better than yours. I, I think I've got a little bit more to offer than, than what you've got to offer me. I don't have anything to offer him. I've often prayed in my prayers, God, if you can use nothing. And here I am. Because I have nothing to offer. Except my will. Here I am. See, this is why when, when we do sin, we should find ourselves running for the altar. Wherever that may be in your home, wherever it is, where the, the nearest altar, find it. It may be the empty restroom stall there at your work. But you find yourself in that altar, and you begin to repent. Forgive me, God. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. I had no right to transgress against you. Forgive me. I had no right to do that against you. Oh, but 
you don't have to do that because grace, grace. That blood of Jesus is so cheap, just throw it everywhere. No. It's the precious blood of Jesus. One drop would have been enough, but he gave it. So when I come to the altar, I know that if I'm there in the name of Jesus Christ, it's the same as if God is hearing his own son, Jesus Christ, making that petition for me. The Bible says that he's at the right hand of the Father interceding for you and for me. I, I, I've often been amazed by this. We, we take prayer so lightly. We, we think prayer is, is just... We, we don't do it. We don't take it seriously. We, we don't. We take our bank accounts more seriously than we do prayer. Think about it, though. If your bank account went out the, tonight, what wouldn't you be doing tomorrow morning to make sure that whatever it was that went wrong... It's, it's right. Can I tell you this? When, when, when you look at prayer and you begin to understand prayer, you see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God, early in the morning praying, middle of the day praying, going into the temple, late in the evening, sometimes stays up all night praying to the Father. Being God, He needed to pray. Somehow the church doesn't think that she needs to pray because Jesus did all the praying for her and some saint somewhere is going to be praying for you and somebody else is going to do the praying for you once you're dead. I'm telling you, if I can't depend on them while I'm alive, much less when I'm dead. But we think something, and, and, and yet the Bible says that even right now, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and me. What is he doing? He's pleading to the Father as you and I are sitting in this building tonight. When we pray, he's saying, that's mine. I'm asking you for this. And God says, come. And he invites you and I, come. Come boldly to the throne of grace. I'll close with this. You see, it's, we have power over all the power of the enemy. And when we come to cast out a devil or come to, to confront the devil on in some instance in the name of Jesus, when I'm standing where I need to be with Christ, no matter what it is, washed in the blood, standing there, and I invoke the name of Jesus, Satan responds. Every time. Every time. I pray that God would help us. I pray that God would help us to understand what Jesus has given us through His blood, through His Word, through His cross, through His resurrection. What has He given us? He's given us all power and all authority. Jesus, the Bible says, as we read, He came to undo, to destroy the works of the devil. Guess whose job that is now? It's still His through us. So when we come in the name of Jesus, what are we doing? We're undoing and destroying the works of the devil. The devil has done havoc in people's lives. Just like my brother sitting here, he's a miracle, he's a testimony of God. It is through the word of God and somebody's preached the word to him just like somebody preached the word to me. And because of that word, they stood there in the name of Jesus. The works of the devil were destroyed in his life and the works of the devil were destroyed in my life just the same. It is dependent upon you and me to walk in that name and destroy the works of the devil. After all, look what he's done in your life since you've given yourself to Jesus Christ in your life. 
Look at what he's tried to do and how he's tried to destroy you. He's come to kill, he's come to steal, he's come to destroy. Imagine those that are without hope that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They need someone to intervene for them. And the only person that can intervene for them is another believer that stands there in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Apart from you and me, living a life, the, the life of Jesus Christ, letting him live his life, there is no hope for this world. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor, the Bible says what good is it but to be thrown out on the streets and to be trampled underfoot. So if we, as the people of God, who claim to have the power of God, who claim to know God, who claim to be able to walk in His name and, and do the things that His Word says, if we have lost that relationship and we don't, we no longer have the power or the, the ability to do what he said, then what good are we as believers? We don't have any power or authority over the devil. No, I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, we do. And that's what the devil is afraid of. And he comes and he tests you. And he tries you and me. And he comes and he tries to throw his blows. But that's why it's so important for us to take up the armor, the, 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 the shield of faith, whereby we quench all the, the fiery darts of the enemy, of the devil himself. That when he comes against us, we stand in faith. And every weapon formed against us, those arrows fly, but they never hit their mark. But what happens is that word goes back. That arrow turns back around and it has to go somewhere. And it'll go return to sender. Let the devil have it. And he's only afraid of a true child of God. He's not afraid of those who claim to be. And, and, and it's amazing if I can. I'll close with this, the last part of that, that verse in chapter 3 that we read. He says, "This in this the children, in verse 10 of chapter 3, of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. And then listen to this. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Amazing test, isn't it? Let me tell you this. If you have a Christian talking about somebody that's supposed to be a brother or a Christian, they are no Christian. Did you hear me? That's what he was saying. Your brother in Christ. If somebody's speaking bad about you, I can tell you this. They are no believer. They are no believer. That's what the Word of God says. Because the Bible says, and Jesus said himself, you have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. He says, but I tell you, that if you're angry at your brother without a reason, he said, you've already committed that. <coughs> Let it go. Forgive. Fine. Because they're not coming against you and me anymore. They're coming against Jesus Christ. Father, tonight, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I, I thank you because you deal with our hearts and you've come so that we could have a life that has overcome death so that we might live in such a way that we would destroy the works of Satan himself. Your enemy, who has now become our enemy. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would begin to make real and make known to our hearts the, the struggle, the fight that we're in, but yet the victory that we have and the power that we have that the power, Father, that you said in your word, that is, that is unequaled, 
to any other power that this world or the devil could think of, God. I pray that that would be realized in the hearts and lives of every person that is hearing my voice today, God. Because Holy Spirit, as I stand up here tonight, this is not me, but this is, these are your words. I don't speak of my own authority. I speak under the authority of your name, Jesus. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just begin to, to break, would begin to pull down strongholds, God, in the hearts and in the lives and the minds of every man and every woman that is sitting here tonight. Pray to God that you would, we would begin to experience, Father, your word, God. That as we delve into it, as we, as we make it a part of our life, as we spend time in your word, God, that your Holy Spirit would begin to make it a reality, that we would begin to live and walk and be in your word, God. That the things that we have read, Father, would begin to manifest themselves in our own lives, God. That when we call upon that name, Jesus, we would have the boldness and the confidence, God, to come against every work of the devil that has come against any one of our lives. Because we know, God, that they are not coming against us. The devil is not coming against us. He's coming against you. And in that name, Jesus, God, we have all authority, all power over him. I pray that, God, that even tonight, Father, strongholds would be broken, Father, off the minds and the hearts of your people, God. That, Father, that they would begin to, to live a life that is pleasing to you. That, Father, that we would begin to walk in righteousness and in true holiness, God, as your word says. That, Father, that we would begin to live a life of boldness, God. That we would begin to walk in truth, Father, and not be uh, tripped up, God, by the enemy. But, Father, that you, Father, by your spirit, God, would give us the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That, Father, that you would begin to speak to your people. And we would hear your voice. We would know you. And that you, God, would begin to change us and transform us. And God, we would begin to see that transformation taking place in our own lives. We would recognize it. Not just others, but we ourselves would begin to recognize God. And that, Father, that we would be surrendered to you give you what is due. We would purify our hearts and purify ourselves, God, for you because of the hope that we have in you. We thank you, Jesus, in your name.